Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Open Minded. Uh, really excited once again. This morning we have Dr. Kerry Spackman, coach of athletes at the highest level, business people and other personalities to succeed with it, their chosen field. Now, I've been a rugby coach all my life and everyone is trying to get just that little bit because at the highest level, you need 1% to win. It's been a consultant for four Formula One teams, as well as the New Zealand All Blacks, specialising in performance optimization. He is a director of New Zealand Government Goldmine Program, which develops specialised electronics and mathematical analysis for Olympic athletics, and we'll talk about that a little later on. Um, just to give you a bit of background, during his working with Formula One, uh, Dr. Kerry Spackman met three times world champion Sir Jackie Stewart, with whom he later worked to develop a program to train professional test drivers. He continues to work with Jackie Stewart um, and Stewart Grand Prix and Jaguar. And he's also the author of The Winner's Bible, Rewire Your Brain for Permanent Change. And I am so, so interested in talking to him about that because when I was really badly depressed, I had to rewire my brain. So, Dr. Kerry, welcome. Absolute pleasure to have you, man. And what a, what a CV, my friend. What a CV. I mean, oh, well. you have sports and then put the science to the sports? How did that all work? Well, it was an interesting journey, to be honest, John. It just sort of started. You know, I started off as a teacher at Auckland Grammar, and then um, it, I did maths, and then um, I set my students a, a problem in maths, and then I thought, well, I better do the simulation myself and realized that it opened up a whole uh, sort of Pandora's box that no one else had really discovered. So I then went to the US, uh, developed some electronics with uh, a guy called Professor Harry Whale, who was involved in getting Neil Armstrong to the moon. He was the most um, top guy in electronics. We developed some equipment together, went to England, and then um, realized we, nobody really knew what went on inside a race driver's or a test driver's brain. So I switched from applied mathematics to cognitive neuroscience and looked at what went inside the brain, worked with the RAF uh, for the Top Gun pilots, and then got involved in Formula One. So it's sort of just followed all these doors that opened, very lucky in some cases to have met the right people, but then, you know, you have to do the hard yards and prepare yourself, you know? Yeah, I think uh, for me, you know, talking about neuroscience, one of the things when I was incredibly unwell, I had no, I had no knowledge of my own um, mental health science, for want of a better word. I read a, I read a book called Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, which was the start of that. And then I talked to um, a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists of just about the state we can be in sometimes. But um, just to get back to Jackie Stewart before we dig into the depression side of stuff, Tell me, um, at the highest level, someone like Jackie Stewart, does he just have an, a, 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 a unbelievable ability in one area? or And how do you measure someone's brain and then replicate that? So Jackie really stood out for me as an exceptional individual. And um, so um, a couple of things stand out. So first of all, um, I did measure his brain on a battery of tests that they use for the Top Gun pilots and also the other test drivers and a few things stood out. But from a personal point of view, uh, winners tend to have the following traits. One, they have a relentless attention to detail. And I mean relentless. It's all about minute details. You, you look at someone like Michael Schumacher or, who, or any of these people, they will be looking for the smallest little things that the average person doesn't see. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is they have um, a work ethic beyond anybody else. Um, really, it's extraordinary. Uh, people say, oh, I'd like to be world champion. And you go, really? Do you really know what it is? And if I can just give you an example of what it's really like to be a world champion. Um, when I was living in England, my, my girlfriend at the time uh, was world duathlon champion, Annie Emerson, tremendous athlete. And she would get up each morning and she would go for this massive swim for about an hour and a half not just like a normal swim but she would beat herself up and come home and sort of crawl in the door have something to eat then go out for a whatever 10k run and then go out and um you know do a 50k cycle at the absolute limit 
and then, you know, each morning she'd kind of crawl out of bed and then get going again. She would do that seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, 10 years. Now I can do that for one week, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but that, uh, that, and she just did it. Now, why did she do that? She had an unbelievable belief in herself. She didn't believe that she was better than anybody else. She really didn't. She always used to turn up on the start line and say, gosh, why am I here? All these other fantastic world athletes, but she just worked her butt off and she got there. So there's relentless attention to detail and this hard work and where does this hard work come from a lot of it comes from a belief in yourself that you believe you can do it and you know even when she didn't think she should be there she just kept on going so she had a mental toughness about her um, and then sort of getting back to your question on elite performance which i think is actually highly related to the whole concept of mental well-being for me i think of it is three components. And the way I think about it is a bit like a computer. You have the software that runs on the computer, all the computer programs. And underneath it, that software runs on the hardware, the chips and the hard drives. And then that whole environment, the software and the hardware works in an environment. The three work together. Now, as a human being, I have physiology. I have bits and bolts in my brain, neurotransmitters, wires. If something goes wrong there, I can be depressed, I can be down, and, and that's a physical thing. If I have uh, really good circuits in there, I can perform well. On top of that, I have the thoughts that run through my head. That's my software. And that's where things like CBT comes involved. You help reprogram some of those pieces of software. And then the third part is the environment. Now, environment is the challenges that happen to you, the experiences you have, the history. They affect the software that you run. They also affect the hardware. And what's really interesting is that the software and the hardware go round in this loop, round and around. The software can actually change the hardware. If you think a lot of thoughts over and over again, those thoughts will grow circuits. That's what the brain does. It will change the actual circuits. It will actually change the level of neurotransmitters in your brain physically. And then that will in turn affect your thought process. So it often it only takes a little thing to tip you over the edge or a little thing to get you going. And the analogy I use coming from Formula One is you can have the best car in the world and you know V12 engine with all the bits and bobs. If the fuel mixture is just a slight a bit wrong, just tiny wrong, that engine will backfire and fart like nothing on earth. It just won't run. You turn the mixture up and then suddenly you're off. Turn it too much and suddenly it's slow again. And it's exactly the same with the human brain. There's a really kind of delicate balance going on in there. And looking after that balance is important. So some people are born with a predisposition physically in their brain to be negative and down. And that's just it's like people born with diabetes, you know, it's, it is what it is. Other people are born very strong and solid brains. They just come out of the box that way. But the good point is that the thought processes you have in your brain can go through and rewire those things. It literally does. You can actually see with scanners and things, different parts of the brain wire up. So the, the, and, and when I'm working with an elite athlete or a, a champion, what you're looking at is the combination of the two their hardware and their software. So Jackie had some fantastic hardware. He had an amazing memory for motion that was just out of this world, but he also had the right thought processes. What do you, what, what do you mean by a memory for motion? Oh, okay. So one of the things we did was we compared Jackie Stewart to professional test drivers in a double blind test to see how good they were feeling a change in a car. Now a test driver, that's their job. It costs $2 billion to make a car design a whole new car from scratch. And the test driver is the key part of it. And they, I tested them and they performed basically a chance. And of course the test driver said, well, Kira, your test is just too hard. You know, it's just a silly test. So we put Jackie Stewart in the car, same test, double blind. I didn't know, he didn't know. He scored like 97%. So then we said, what is his brain? Why is he different to everybody else? We thought, was it reaction times? Was it this, was it that, was it the other thing? The answer was none of those. What really? it was, 
is no, they weren't exceptional at all. What it was, was he, I could put him through uh, um, a motion, I could move him in a special machine called a vestibular chair, which you close your eyes and you move them around and you say what happened, or you can move him around and make a very slight difference. And he has to tell me what the difference is. Well, he could store huge amounts of information about the motion. And in fact, in one time, we had him uh, drive a car and he drove through a corner and, and I said, well, what happened? And he said, well, when I first turned the steering wheel, I noticed that the bushing did this and, and he went on for like about 10 minutes talking about the first one second of turning the car into a corner. And I had it all on audio. And I thought he could, well, he could feel he could feel like the suspension and everything moving. In one second, he gave me a five minute debrief of what happened in that one second. Wow. And I thought he's making this up. I thought, come on, this is, this is he's just having my having me on. But of course, we had the car instrumented and we looked at all the data and everything he said was absolutely true. So now if you can remember all that detail and then you change something on a car, next time you go around, you go, well, I can compare it. So for me, I can only compare really, really broad things. I missed the apex or the car, you know, skidded out at the back. I have only big details. He had all this fine detail, which he, had, he could play with. And that gets back to our point on details. He had this right. attention to detail. Now he trained that. Yeah, but what, what I would like to challenge you on, is I would just call that X factor. But what you're telling me is you can understand that and train that. So how do, you make that, how do you make that link? Because I would go, you know, Jackie Stewart just had X factor in his motion brain. Or <laughs> Yep, so he did. So he had a, a natural competitive advantage, just as some people are born with bigger muscles. But you know what? If I train my muscles every day, they will gradually get bigger and bigger. Maybe I'll never have muscles as big as Arnold Schwarzenegger, but for sure I'll improve my muscles. So we went through a whole program with the test drivers and said, no point going round and round and round in circles and practicing, because you're just practicing your same mistakes. That was a great phrase of Jackie's. They're just practicing their mistakes over and over again. So what we said was, how can we train, train that one part that's their rate limiting factor, their memory for motion. So we gave them specific exercises for their motion memory. And Sure enough, suddenly the test drivers went from not performing to performing really well. And it's the same a bit like the car analogy with the mixture. You've just got to find what that weak spot is. You fix that and suddenly the whole engine kicks in, the whole human kicks in. So everybody has these kind of weak spots. And one of the keys is finding them and then finding the targeted program to fix those weak spots. It's a bit like, um, you know, a runner doesn't just run 100 meters all day. Usain Bolt does squats. That's a good way of strengthening the muscle. The, someone asked me the other day what a, what a great All Black is. And I said, when talent meets work ethic, meets intelligence constantly, right? Perfect. So, so what I wanted to talk to you about was growth mindset. So if, if I think about elite sports people, the All Blacks I know, the other athletes I've met, you know, talking about, um, so Jackie Stewart, people like that. Tell me what a growth mindset is, because most of the people that I seem to have met have this. Now, I just want to put a bit of a caveat there, because I hate words. So when I, when I go into businesses, I hate values-based words that don't have something yep. under them to explain what it is. Because if I said to you, you know, um, you know, Dr. Kerry, I love you. You're right, and you go, yeah, right, okay, okay, thanks very much, love you too. So we're, you know, love is a doing word, right? Yeah. Yep. So it's got to have some actions under it that whoever you love, you know, you agree on. A growth mindset is one of those things where when I talk about it, I go, I don't, I can't really identify how I can do that or put my, put my finger on some things that I need to do. So could you just explain what you think being the expert, what a growth mindset is and some of the things that we can do to help ourselves be in a growth mindset. Yeah, so that's a really difficult question and I'm probably not an expert in growth mindsets. However, I can tell you what I've seen has helped people grow. Now that's a good answer. The objectively, they have changed. So the first thing is you have to be, you know, quite scrupulous at about measuring your own weaknesses. That's really important. Most people don't know 
their own weaknesses. They don't know what they don't even know. So that's important um, because it's only when you know what you don't know that you're actually able to improve it. So then, um, and then a lot of people will kind of give that mental assent. They'll just say, oh yeah, yeah, I need to improve that. I say, what we need to do is actually write that down in a way that it's really clear so that it's crystal clear in front of you what it is that we need to do. Then I say, is there any reason for those things? Now, those things might just have occurred by random chance, some of these weaknesses. You might have been you know, given a message at school or by your parents or whatever, and I call that accidental hypnosis. You've accidentally been hypnotized without anyone wanting to do you any damage by giving you messages in your brain that you've accepted that this is who I am or this is what I am. Then the next thing is I think you do your homework really well. How do you find a way of improving that aspect? So for me, for example, on the memory for motion thing, that was a surprise to me. I didn't expect to find that in the test drivers and I didn't expect that to find that in Jackie. So then the next thing I say is, well, what is the best way to improve that? And I said, I don't know the answer, but I'm sure gonna do my homework. I'm gonna to talk to NASA, I'm gonna to talk to the RAF, I'm gonna to talk to the top, I'm gonna to talk to all the people who know about this and we'll find out the way to do it. So in some cases, uh, growth requires a bit of help from an expert sometimes because you only see things from inside yourself. I look out of my shell and I see me. I want other people to show me what it is that might be rate limiting my performance. Then we have the, the experts who have been down there. And the, the problem, John, is there are a lot of experts who give you, as you would say, lots of buzzwords. And I really struggle with that because a lot of experts mean well, but they're not really delivering on the job. And that for me is the answer. If a person is able to say, I had this person come in, I turned them around and I don't see them ever again, and they're on their happy way. Well, that's a great result. I'm not sure if I've answered your question there because yeah, it's, no. it's, it's a difficult uh, question. Excuse me leaning over because I, 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 I started taking notes. So understand your weakness, which is not easy, right? Because you have to look in the mirror. I, I often say to people, you know, sometimes when I'm cleaning my teeth, I look in the mirror and I ask myself those questions, you know, what can I get better at? But then do your homework and study. And if you need, if you need some expertise, go and get it and then implement that stuff. Once you implement it, what do you do with, what do you do if you start failing? You just keep um, on the track. Uh, so for me, failure means we're not doing the right thing. That really means that. It's not that you're dumb or you're stupid or you are a failure yourself. It means we haven't found the right solution for you. And I'm a firm believer in that. Sure, we have to be persistent and you don't go from a, a, a very poor mental state to a very good mental state overnight. Nobody does. It's, it's a process. It's a climbing. It's like training. All these things are slow, uh, steady, but improving. The key is, if you're not improving, then we haven't found the key to unlocking whatever the problem is. And that's really, really, you really need to look at that. Um, yeah. When we, had a, when we had a discussion the other day, pre-doing this, we were talking about mathematics and our, and our youngsters. So you're talking about, um, you know, no one's fault hypnosis. So yep. we were talking about the maths and you, you said to me, you know, JK, anyone can learn maths if they have the right process. And I'm going, oh, come on, Dr. Kerry, mate. They told me when I was at school that you're either naturally in maths or you're not. And that I, I totally believe that up until I spoke to you last week. Is so that I, about predefined beliefs? Um, so you were, you were told that and you believed that. Now, when you were young, here's something about the brain, which is really interesting. Um, the brain is not just one big computer. It's made up of lots of different modules. Some of the modules are to do with logic. Some are to do with emotions, like the limbic system. Now, the emotional system is really important. If anything is really either scary or emotional, the brain says, I better take note of that. If a tiger is about to eat my leg, I really want to avoid that. So the whole emotional system gets up. So when you are young, and I'll use an analogy here, and, and, and I think it's quite a strong one. It, imagine there's a young girl in a playground and she looks over and sees all the cool kids. 
And she says, oh, I want to join the cool kids. And she yells out, can I come and join you? And one of the kids in the cool group says, no, nah, you're ugly. Now, at that moment, she was emotionally vulnerable. At that moment, her limbic system was kicked in. That one careless throwaway line from someone who didn't know, no one's evaluated her beauty, seared her soul. And she may well now think for the rest of her life, she is ugly. She's been accidentally hypnotized. Now, you were at school. You probably failed at some part of the mass. You couldn't do it. You're kind of upset. You're frustrated. You're emotionally vulnerable. Someone says, hey, JK, you're either good at it or bad at it, and you just happen to be useless at it. Bang. It's in your soul. It's done. The message is there. Now, that reinforces. It, it's like, you know, the more you believe in something, the more you give up on it. And so it's that vicious cycle. Now, I am an expert in maths because you know I got the senior prize in applied maths at university and I, and I have taught it. And I can say, sure, some people have more aptitude than other people. Absolutely. There's no question about that. Aptitude varies, but there's no reason for any kid if they're taught properly at the right level for them to fail at maths. And so, you never achieved your potential at mass. I guarantee if we, re we rewound the clock and took you all the way back and said, hey, John, you failed at that, not a problem. The reason is because you didn't understand that. Now, let me explain it in a way that you understand. Then you go, oh, I get it. Then you're on to the next level, on to the next level. And mass is a cumulative subject. You build each level step by step. And if the third level is faulty, you can't make the fourth level. You suddenly hit your head and it's all over. So you fail at one level, it's all over. Well, I, I was that kid. In fact, um, I often talk, when I talk about my mental health, I talk about my sharks, right? And one of my sharks was, um, I felt dumb. And that's because I was told I was dumb. Um, obviously now I've understood when possibly I was emotionally um, vulnerable, a bit like the, the story you told about the little girl who felt ugly. And I took a lot of those things with me in my life. I'd walk into a room and feel inferior because I felt dumb. The, the interesting thing about a growth mindset and the other thing I wanted to talk to you about from a science point of view was um, I did CBT, which was incredibly tiring, right? So, I, I mean, with me, I just changed the dialogue. So I just called it rewiring my brain because that's what it felt like. It was incredibly tiring to start with, especially the first five or six days. But actually, I felt that I did rewire my brain and that, you know, I made peace with those sharks, the dumb shark, and started to accept me for who I was, my weaknesses, which is really interesting that you've touched on both those things. So how do you actually start to rewire your brain? And what, what actually is that? Why was I tired? Um, so first of all, um, rewiring your brain is a tiring process. You know, it's like training your muscles. You get tired in the gym. No question about it. Secondly, you are actually dealing with some of the key things that make you who you are. You have a set of beliefs about who John is, and I have a set of beliefs about who Kerry is. And those beliefs are ingrained in me. And we're challenging who we are when we rewire those brains. And then thirdly, probably at the same time, when you're dealing with your sharks, you're probably your physiology, your, your brain hardware is not in its optimal state yet because it's got the wrong programs. So it's kind of a really bad place to be. It's trying to like, you know, do heart surgery on a broken heart while it's still ticking. It's really quite difficult. So it's quite natural to feel like you're going through um, a hurricane while you're doing the CBT, not unnatural, because you are rewiring the essence of who you are in a state while you're not at your optimal. Not surprising there. And tell me, so the interesting thing, so here's another couple for you, and this will come back to, um, you know, a growth mindset or rewiring your brain. I have been taught to believe that, uh, you can learn more under the age of 13, and it'll take you twice as much time to learn it over the age of 13. Is that true or false? I mean, am I out of luck now that I'm in my mid 50s around my learning rewiring or how does that work? Okay, so um, this is a really interesting question and it's got a slightly complicated answer. 
So as I said before, your brain is made up of lots of different modules and they do mature at different rates. So if you look at the frontal lobe of your brain and how that gets matured, that takes ages and ages to mature. So it takes into your 20s before that part of the brain is wired properly, which is why teenagers are silly because they've got all these hormones pumping through them. They've got all these emotions going through, but their logical executive function is not properly developed. On the other hand, areas like your language, they develop in the temporal lobes, they develop very quickly and they do tend to freeze over somewhat early on. So if you learn a language, say before you're 10, a second language, you'll probably end up speaking it with a native tongue as if it was your real language. If you start learning that at 25, you will learn the language, you will get all the words, but you will speak it as a, as a typically, um, this is typically, as a second language. You'll know that that's not your native language. So now the question is learning. Well, it depends what you are learning. So if you have built a solid platform, so for example, if we just go back to maths, I can learn more maths today than I probably could younger on because I've got a great, fantastic platform to build on. I've got this huge, big muscle under there of maths that I can build on. And it's like um, uh, even in sports, some, some parts uh, do, do freeze over relatively early, which is why athletes are, are trained very young in, in certain sports. But hey, as you go on, you're refining the details. So getting back to things like elite performance, uh, mental health. Now those are high executive function things. Those are the parts of the brain that really don't freeze over. And in fact, there's been some research that shows that if you have a low IQ, and this is a little bit controversial, as you get older, you know, your brain kind of falls off. If you have a high IQ, you actually increase because you're constantly challenging that brain. You're constantly stimulating it and you can continue to learn. So for me, I would say um, it's like anything. The more you use it, the better it gets. So it's not all over, you know, for sure. Like, you know, I mean, I did uh, maths uh, up until I was probably 32. I enrolled in my PhD on brains at about 34, 35 whole different subject from scratch no there problem go. there you go, I'm there, you go. there is hope for me <laughs> there's hope for everybody there is hope for everybody i mean that's the point and and the interesting thing is the more and this sounds a bit strange but the more um positive your brain is the better it ages nice. that's, a, that's a fact so tell me glass half full glass half empty so tell me um, the link between rewiring your brain and a growth mindset. Yeah, so growth is about changing the things that you think. If I'm learning, I, knew, I know new things to think about. I've got new information in my brain. A growth mindset is I have new ways of looking at the same problem. How do you, what is a fixed mindset then? Is that for me, when you get really frustrated with someone who you're talking to who just won't change their opinion, how, how do you know what a fixed mindset is? Um, so, okay, so from my point of view, what I constantly do is I look at the problem and say, can I see it from a different perspective? I constantly do that. So going back to uh, the, the Ford Motor Company with the test drivers, you know, my job there was to deliver some electronics that actually measured the cars. That was the job. While I was there, I looked at the data and I said, yep, I can see the difference between this car and that car and this prototype and a Mercedes. But I said to myself, gosh, I'm also seeing a difference in all the test drivers. They're all doing it differently. No one asked me to look at that. I said, well, hold on, if they're all doing it differently, they can't all be doing it perfectly. We need to look at that. So a growth mindset is about constantly evaluating your assumptions constantly looking at something from a different perspective so if someone is fixed in their mind well then they aren't learning they aren't growing you know if you believe the same things today as you believed 20 years ago you haven't grown you know i you know and sometimes you meet people and you go gosh they're the same person as they were 20 years ago and i think how sad is that other times you meet people and you go wow 
look at how that person has developed. I know you're really, really passionate about mental health. And, and so how do you think these things are really, really important if, um, you know, someone's suffering with depression or, you know, do, can you be depressed and have a growth mindset? I know that it helped me rewire my brain. So I know you're passionate about this mental health area, but what approaches would you take versus Dr. Jackie Stewart or you are, you know, running a business and one of your staff members might have come to you and said, look, I'm really struggling. What, would, what sort of things would you do? So I, I, the first thing I ever do when I'm working with anybody, uh, the first thing is just to actually understand that person. That's really important. Like, honestly, I would work with some of the All Blacks as an example, and I'd go into a meeting, I'd sit down with them and I'd go, I have no idea what I'm gonna do with this person. I literally, why am I here? Am I a fraud? Then I say, just start talking to me. And I listen and I go, aha, here's something I need to pick on. Here's something that I need to follow up on. And then, so it's the listening. And I always say, I'm not what gonna you, give- I'm not gonna, what, what are you listening for? I'm just listening. I don't have a particular goal in mind. I just listen and I just listen until I find something that I go, now that is interesting. And I always say to the person, I'm not going to give you any advice or anything on the first session ever, because I really need to go away and think about this. And I need to work out the best answer for this. And I need to be really sure because, you know, I take someone else's livelihood really seriously, really seriously. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm working with some top international drivers at the moment, same sort of deal. The first thing is I do is I just, let's just talk. And inevitably, as you listen, you find a little thing. And, and there's a clue. Uh, my, my grandfather uh, was, you know, the Honourable Sir Trevor Henry, top judge of New Zealand, a really genius of a man, lived to 105. And he always used to say to me, Kerry, the key, and I called them grandpa's little things. And, he, and he, he said, when I'm a judge, I hear all the big stories. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. You know, I didn't have the gun. Those are the big stories. That's what the lawyers talk about. He said, I listen to the little stories. It's some little thing that they say that gives me the clue as to what's going on. And, you know, you might be talking to me and there might be some little wee tiny thing that you, you, you say maybe to a waiter at, at dinner the way you talk to that waiter, the way you interrupt me or some other little thing. And I go, aha, now that's a grandpa's little thing. So I listen for those things. And because everyone's heard the big story, to be honest, you know, if you go to any coach, the first thing they'll do is listen to the big story. You know, I was beaten by my father. I was this and I was that. Oh, those are all the big stories. I got those. We know that. Yep. What are the little stories? And, um, those are often the most insightful. Sure, we deal with the big stories later, but they give me a clue on how to get in there. And then afterwards, what do you, do you formulate a personalized program and start talking yep. to that person about uh, growth mindset, rewiring the brain? Do you change the dialogue? I mean, yep. if, you yep. are, if you have a dumb shark like me, when I'm sitting down and talking to someone like yourself, I'm intimidated with your intelligence. I'm intimidated by... Um, you know, why I'm actually, why I'm actually here talking to you, you know, is this going to hurt as, you know, mentally? So how do you sort of personalize a program and break down some of those barriers? Uh, so the first thing uh, is most people are really relieved when they hear a coherent, logical explanation as to why they're where they're at. That's the first thing. If I can say, hey, Mr. X or Mrs. Y, you know what, I get where you're at and I understand why and we have a plan. That for them is a massive relief because you know no one wants to be struggling and they have worked their hardest to find the solution. And if I can come at it from a different angle and say, yep, I see what you've done, I see why you've done it and I understand that that's your best effort. I've come at it from a slightly different per, per direction, you know, and I think I found something here and there's a good reason for it. There's a good reason why this has happened. Now let's work on this good reason. Let's reframe the problem and find a solution. And, you know, sometimes the results can really be quite dramatic. 
um, really tr quite dramatic. Dramatic in their well-being, dramatic in, because... In performance and well-being. So yeah, if you said to, like, if, if I know elite athletes, incredibly competitive, yep. when, sometimes when you front us with a problem, we're going to push back straight away, right? Yep. Okay, and, let me give you a, a concrete example. Cool. Okay. Uh, I can't mention any names, obviously, because that's yep. the whole deal. But we have a race driver, again, this is just race driving, who is unbelievably talented one of the best in the world really really good really motivated i mean no elite athletes not motivated you don't need to motivate these people they are seriously motivated now his issue is that when things go wrong often outside his own control um he basically threw the toys out of the cot okay someone's done something wrong in the team something has gone wrong here not his fault he then gets out of that, uh, out of being in the zone, and his performance falls down. Now, the question is, how do we get him out of that state? So his thing is, someone's done something wrong. I want to give them hell to pay because that's my life. My uh, they haven't allowed me to execute my performance as as well as it should be, and that's a valid argument. You know, someone leaves a wheel off. I'm just making something up here, but someone leaves a wheel off and he goes out of the pits and he crashes. Well, I'd be really upset as well. Okay. So that's a rational uh, answer. I'll yell at anybody, I'll throw the toys out so it doesn't happen again. Another way of looking at it is when I get out of that zone, now motor racing, you really need to be in the zone. Everything's happening far too fast. You can't process consciously, it has to be all unconscious. As soon as he gets out of the zone, his own performance falls over so i said uh, a long story but the point is instead of focusing on all the things that have gone wrong i said what we've got to do is right now make sure you never get out of the zone we've got to make you robust so whatever happens we can deal with it and and perform well and the team has said it's like a different driver you know in, in, the, in a previous weekend three things went wrong and he just sailed through them all and performed immaculately. We reframed how he viewed the world. I said, look, you know, the problem with what's going on outside the team, that's a different problem to what's going on inside your head. We need to help you deal with um, keeping in the zone regardless of what happens. And, and, and we did that. They, they, in our sport, they call it noise. You've got to yep. stay out of, uh, uh, really interesting that you think um that the zone is unconscious whereas i thought it would be superior consciousness okay so this is a really important point so in motor racing um for example things are happening so you know for example the car might start to oversteer so you go oh it's oversteering i better put some opposite lock in to fix it okay now what's happening there is the information comes up into your brain this is when you're learning goes into your conscious part you said oh i need to do this and then I work out an answer and it goes back down again. And so when you're learning things, it's always kind of slow and jerky. You learn to play tennis and it's kind of very rough. But you do that often enough and the information comes up and goes back down again a million times or a thousand times. And at the back of your brain, there's a special module called the cerebellum. And it says, well, I'm watching this. I watch the problem come up and I watch you work out the answer and you give it back. So rather than doing that every time, why don't I just store the problem and the answer all in one go so it's automatic. And so when you're automatic, when you when you allow these, th this is physical performance, you know, like hitting a tennis ball or doing a gymnastics tumble. When you allow the unconscious parts that have been trained over and over and over and over to execute that, you're in the zone, it's just effortless. Then suddenly, you know, for, imagine you're a, a, a gymnast and you go to the, you know, and you've done this tumble a thousand times. It's all stored here. You don't even have to think about it. You go to the Olympics and then you say, oh my God, I got one jump. You know, I got one tumble I got to do. This is my whole gold medal. It's four years of my life. You suddenly think about it consciously. Uh oh, it's all gone into this manual process and they fall over. And you've seen this happen so many times. Golfers call it the yips. Um, people, you know, just can't do the basic things that they've been able to do. So we take this driver and, you know, he's been racing all his life. 
he's been able to control the car and all these things are just barrage of information coming into his brain, which is processed unconsciously. Now that's different from his executive function about making big decisions. This is the muscular control. As soon as that becomes conscious, it's all over. And you see people that, you know, can kick a football over a goal a thousand times, suddenly a big moment and they, they, they can't even kick it, they can't even get it off the, off the thing. So yeah, a, a, physical, a physical task like that really depends on this unconscious. And so you can imagine if a driver gets out of that doing, you know, 200, 300K on a car that's so, so quick responsive, you'll never keep up. So, so for that driver, the whole thing falls over. So um, when the mind replays it, and this is really interesting because I've been in the zone and I've been out of the zone. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, some people say, oh, the whole world slowed down or I can't even remember. Is that just your, uh, I can't even remember the scientific name you gave for the bit of the back of your head. Cere cerebellum, yeah. Cerebellum, yeah. Don't let me spell that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, the cerebellum, does that play different personalities get it played back in different ways so for example michael jordan says oh the whole world just slow down i can see the ball in slow motion or yep yeah. so when you're in the unconscious uh physical part of performance all the actions are taken care of unconsciously by those circuits that have been built up over many many years and your conscious part of the brain can just sit there and watch and it just says because it's not busy doing anything it's got all the time in the world and it does feel like time slows down you or it even feels effortless that you didn't have to do anything so i mean i've never played rugby uh, properly you know <laughs> and grandma was like the worst team of possible um but you know you can imagine if you are really skillful you'll be running towards the opposition and you'll just unconsciously know what they're going to do and be able to sidestep them in a way that you go that was magic to the outside person. And again, you know, to, to, to go back to uh, sports, um, and sorry about the analogy here, but it's a really interesting one. Um, Andre Agassi, fantastic returner of serve. Really, really good. That was his thing. Now you test his reaction times and he's no better than you or I. Why is he so good at returning a serve? Well, there's an experiment that's been done where they play the video of the opposition winding up and hitting the serve. And you can stop that video at any time you want. For you or I, and we have to work out whether it's a forehand or a backhand. So for you or I, we have to wait till the opposing person has hit the ball and it's actually got about halfway over the net and then we can go left or right, forehand or backhand, okay? Andre Agassi, for example, can tell before the guys even hit the ball. He's got all these unconscious cues that he's picked up over time that he knows just the way the person is addressing the ball, it's going to be a forehand. So he has all the time in the world to react because he's got a head start over your eye because he's got all his attention to detail. He's got all these little bits that he knows and they're unconscious. He doesn't think about them. He just has this gut feel. It's going left and he's right. He's is, that like the, is that like the Sir Jackie Stewart's? Yep. natural response to his mo mo movement stuff so i think um you know jackie was dyslexic which is interesting um at, uh, here's an interesting story at school he was tiny he is tiny um and because he was dyslexic the, the teacher said he's dumb and been he said there, done that. been there done that i mean really dumb he said he can't read well, you're just stupid, you can't read, you're tiny, you can't do anything. He honestly thought, what's the point in life? He honestly thought, why carry on? And yet he hopped behind a car, uh, the steering wheel, and he drove and suddenly the world came open to him. He had this amazing ability. Um, he's also all clays, um, uh, shooting champion for the Olympics for England just has this you know, phenomenal ability. So he's not dumb. And if you actually talk to him, he's a really smart man. He just has a problem with dyslexia. So he learned to read and he learned to, to, to study in his adult years. And, you know, he can, he, he said, you know, when I'm, uh, when I win the race at, um, you know, Monaco or whatever, the king and queen don't want to hear about tires or the engine. I need to better to talk to them about world events. So he's a very intelligent man that was you know, accidentally hypnotized to thinking he was dumb when he's really, really, really smart. 
The interesting thing for me is, so I'm listening to this podcast, I'm at home. Um, I want to start rewiring my brain and having a, you know, growth mindset, but I don't have Dr. Kerry to come and sit with me and, and um, analyze me because I'm not an elite athlete. What were some of the things you would advise people at home to say, right, do these things um, and here's your checklist? What, what, what could we say to them? Uh, <laughs> so that's a difficult question because, you know, I wrote a little book called The Winner's Bible, which had some of those ideas in it just because I didn't set out to write it. It was just, again, a different person said to me, I, don't, I didn't believe this was going to work. I mean, I really didn't believe this was going to work. And then it, you've done it and it's worked for me. You need to write a book about it. Unfortunately, that book is kind of now out of print because it's, you know, sold a gazillion copies. So, um, I mean, places like what you're doing, John, they have resources. You have ideas there. You know, I would ask people to reach out to, to places exactly like you're doing. You know, there are good people. We just need to connect to them. Um, it's not about any one individual. So getting back, so I'm sitting at home and I go, right, I, first thing I need to do is maybe look at my weaknesses and where I want to get better, right? Yep. Do some study on it. Have the courage to reach out to someone to help you. And then just don't be worried about failing. Just, just if, you, if you fail, it means it's, it's the wrong thing for you. Absolutely. So you've, you've put it in a nutshell. Look at yourself, find out what's wrong. Go and see somebody. That's really, really important. If you're struggling, you've probably tried your hardest on your own. And there's no point trying and, you know, definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And if you go and see somebody and it's not working, it's simply the wrong person helping you. Don't give up at that stage. Don't say it's me. It's the wrong person helping you. Find there will be someone who can help you. There absolutely is. It's just finding that person. That's why, you know, I think, networks like what you're doing are so important you know you can't solve everybody's problems but you can raise the issues and you can connect with people and there's good people out there i'm a ceo of a of a business in new zealand and australia and um a, a ceo said to me the other day that uh he was he realized that there was no one being creative because they had so much fear in their lives um, fear of COVID, fear of getting the sack, fear of, you know, fear of their mortgages. There was all this fear around. So I know that there's some problems out there. How do I create a growth mindset in the work environment? If you're creating the environment itself, well, that's really, I mean, that's really important that fear doesn't exist. And, and I'll tell you a little easy story to, to understand. Have you got a couple of minutes for this? We can always yep. edit it out. <laughs> so imagine, imagine a guy walking along and he comes up again beside the master and they walk together along the desert and the young guy says to the master, master, tell me what are the steps on the highway of life? And the master turns to him and says, my son, there are four steps on the highway of life. He said, what's the first step? And the master says, fear. Everyone is ruled by fear fear of what someone else will say, fear of failure, fear of what I'll look like, fear. And you think about it, a lot of what we do is driven unconsciously by some type of fear of those sorts of things. If you have fear, you can never be creative because you will never go out of where you're at. If you have fear, you'll never do great things. So the, 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 the guy keeps walking for a while and he says to the master, gosh, I get that. And we all have different levels of fear about different things in our life. Well, what happens when you conquer fear? And the master says, you have impetuousness. You then say to yourself, oh, I can do this and I can do that and I can do the other thing. I'm not scared of anything. Well, impetuousness is also kind of dangerous. <laughs> you can do lots of things, but you might do all sorts of things that are not the right thing to do. So impetuousness is the second step on the highway of life. He keeps walking a while and he thinks, wow, okay, well, what is the third step? And he asks the master, oh, what is the third step? And the master says, if you have conquered fear and impetuousness, you have power. You really have power. You can say to people, come and they'll come, go and they'll go. You can do things. You really have power. And he thought about that. Yeah, 
impetuousness, fear. And then he said, well, crikey, I hate to ask what the fourth step on the highway of life. And at this stage, the, the master gets a bit mysterious and says, to know that you are but dust on the highway of life, that everything's important, but nothing's important. And it's quite a balance. Everything is important. You know, everything I want to do today is important. Everyone I meet is important. But you know what? I've got to take it with a grain of salt because in a million years, no one will know who I am. So it's that balance between the here and the now. And, and those things, I think, that's a kind of a high level philosophy, but it's quite an interesting one. But I mean, I think if I was a CEO and I want to create that culture, just listening to that story, you've got to break down those fear barriers and actually talk about them. I, the, I talk about, um, you know, bringing my emotions instead of locking them in the cupboard of my brain, I bring and rest them on my knee, right? So you've got to talk about those fears and break them down so people can get creative. And then if I've understood you rightly, the next step is, well, you haven't gone from a fear-ridden person to, to um, you know, Einstein. <laughs> You've got to focus that in the area that suits you. And then it's also important not to get too stressed about that as well, because you've got to understand that there are mistakes to happen and it's all part of the journey, if I've understood the, the four steps. Yeah, so I think if you go back to a specific example for a CEO, which you answered, and I went off on a bit of a tangent there, um, creating a culture of creativity is a deliberate action. It's really important and you need to go through steps. So first of all is making sure everyone feels comfortable, which is the lack of fear, and able to do different things. You've got to, you've got to say you are allowed to do these things. Now, some people, you do not want to be creative. There's no question about that. You don't want your accountant to be creative and you know make up all sorts of numbers and you end up in jail. You want them to go through step by step. There are other people, and there are you know people who clean the floor. They, they need to do the job. But there are certain executives that you absolutely want to be creative, otherwise the company will stagnate. So you've got to give them the space to be creative, which means taking away some of the routine things. So for me, if I want to be creative, I make sure I have a space of time and place where I can do things. That's, that's important. Uh, the next thing is creativity requires a rich environment where ideas are shared. You can't be creative in a vacuum. You need to interact with other people who are also creative. Like at McLaren, one of the things they did was every now and again, they would have people from totally different disciplines come in and talk about something. It might be a guy on nuclear power and he would talk about something and you'd go, nuclear power, yeah, we make race cars. And I remember meeting after meeting, we'd be in these bizarre meetings and someone would go, oh, I've just had an idea with our tires. And you go, really? tires, <laughs> nuclear power, and there's a connection. And it's this stimulation of what, because if you just think linearly, well, let's just do, you know, you're in business X, so let's look at all the things with X. You're going to go where everyone's thinking. You have these other ideas that are coming in from different directions. You can synthesize them. You know, someone from rugby can give someone as a CEO an idea because these things are cross-pollinate. So I think you give them the space, you reduce the fear, you clear them up from the routine things, if they are those sorts of executives, and then you give them the environment where they can learn new tools and techniques so they can think about things in a different way. That's awesome. At Mentimia, we um, we talk about, you know, trying to find the ultimate um, recipe for a great life, a life well lived, healthy mind, you know, growth mindset, all that sort of stuff. And we've come up with the six pillars um, and I sort of call the six pillars my daily mental health plan. So yep. when I eventually rewired my brain, but I'd just like to ask you um, personally, so what do you do to chill out? Uh, so I'm an active chiller. So uh, for me, um, I like to go to the gym. That's really good physical exercise for me because I, I use my little brain all the time. So that's good. I love going to the gym. Uh, I love driving my little race car. That's something I can't think about anything else when I'm in there. You know, it's life and death, John. You know, it's like I've really got to be on the case. And I come home from that, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm beaten up from this car. Um, and then, of course, there's friends. You know, you hang out with good people. So those are the very simple things for me. How do you connect? 
with people yeah um i don't know it just seems to come naturally to me I, I i don't think it's an effort i don't know why that is i i just meet people as they are i've never looked at a person for what their titles or their achievements i just like people and it just it's just fun to, to hang out with people so um it, it's again just i guess it's grandpa's little things you listen to what people say and you get to know them and they get to know you and when you know each other you connect so what do you do and when we talk about do and the six pillars it's getting better at something for example during COVID, i took up the guitar um because i feel as if i'm getting better and growing i mean i guess it's a little bit of that growth mindset are you what are you doing at the moment to to motivate or get better or challenge yourself um so a challenge for me is new zealand is now the worst in the english-speaking world the worst in mathematics bottom english-speaking world so i'm highly motivated to see if i can help fix that so i'm working really hard on that and there is a solution that's a, that's a a business academic challenge something i believe in because i don't want people to be left behind i don't want new zealand to be a third world country we can't compete which is where we're headed you know we're behind albania you know i mean unbelievable in mass so that's the academic uh challenges driving my race car you know like i didn't start driving till i was six uh, racing till i was 62 that's really old you know really old and i've got a really quick race car that really wants to bite my ass so that that is uh you know that's a fantastic challenge and my lap times have just come down and down and down and down and down because i've just constantly improved every day i go out there i say can i find another detail and i just keep surprising myself i just keep thinking well that must be the limit of this car and it's just you know you go wow so that is fantastic you know and then just you know just i, I like learning john that, that that to me is what keeps the brain going and i think i'm the same that's beautiful yeah how do you if besides the gym because what i'm trying to encourage people that you know um gym's important and exercise is important but also as movement you know so if you're not in the gym what else do you do to move Ah, well, I go for uh, long bike rides in the mountains with my girlfriend, and we have a lot of fun doing that. And that's always kind of cool. Getting outdoors is good. I love running in the sunshine. That's is a sense of freedom in that. Um, and I think ultimately, and this will sound kind of strange, and you can cut this out if you want to. Um, you know, I wake up each morning and I think I've had a pretty good life. You know, I've, I've been lucky. I've gone around the world. I've met all sorts of people and I've had a really good life. What is tomorrow going to hold that yesterday didn't hold? And if I think I can help somebody else, that adds huge value to me. Doesn't matter what it is. I think, you know what? I don't need it for myself anymore. If I can do something to help somebody else, that's kind of cool. That is very cool. How do you celebrate? Um, well, that's a good question because I do celebrate because I think that's really important. I think um, if you don't savor the successes, then they're meaningless. You just move on to the next one. And you don't even realize what you've done. So for me, it is partly sharing it with friends, you know, not as in skiting or showing off, but just go, hey, you know, you know, we just that was so cool, you know, and, um, you know, and that's across anything. You know, we, we, we make a good video for a kid, you know, that at school and you go, wow, look at that, you know, and, and you share it with people. I, I think it's sharing the success, you're sharing your happiness. I, I think I celebrate by sharing. What do you enjoy the most? Out of everything in life? Um, for me, it's, this is a deep thing, it's creating something that nobody else has created. There's some sense of personal satisfaction, doesn't matter what it is. So someone paints a painting that no one else has painted, you go, that's cool. So if I can create something that I think no one else has done, I go, yeah, that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. I've got some quick fire questions for you. Which public figures or famous person around the world do you think has some great habits and behaviors around growth mindset or well-being or anyone who jumps to your mind? Oh, easily. We've mentioned him before, Jackie Stewart, and you picked up on that. He has transformed my life since I met him just by observing how he goes about life. Integrity is number one for that man. Relentless attention to detail, kindness. You know, he's just kind and he's a fun, happy guy. And you go, you, you hang around a guy like that and you go, well, so he, he really 
sticks out. It's special. What are you reading? Uh, <laughs> a book on quantum mechanics. <laughs> so it's not your typical self-help book but um yeah quantum mechanics nice what uh, do you listen to podcasts if, if so why are you listening to anything at the moment uh not podcasts in general um i do watch quite a few of the royal society lectures because i find well they are i guess podcasts i guess but i find those intellectually stimulating for me what keeps you awake at night yeah quite a few things um the things that keep me awake is just how can I improve what I'm doing and am I a good person? It's really easy to get um, locked up in your own self-worth and your own value. You think, oh gosh, this and that and the other thing. And you go, actually, am I actually making other people's lives better or is this just an ego thing? What do you think is an open mind? Uh, an open mind is absolutely a person who is willing to say everything I've held dear and true to me, everything right down to my essence could well be wrong and could well be wrong. And I remember meeting that guy, Professor Whale, who um, was the guy that got Neil Armstrong to the moon, genius of a guy, but he had the most open mind I'd ever thought, you know, anytime we did any experiment, you think, well, you know, see, this could be wrong. You know, I, I, I could be wrong here. He was absolutely happy to admit he was wrong on everything. He was totally open to that. Who would you like me to interview next? Oh, <laughs> uh, I have no idea, John. <laughs> That's might, a good, good question. I, I might go for Sir Jackie. What do you reckon? <laughs> oh, if you can get him, he's an extraordinary man. I mean, he would be very diff difficult to get. Um, but yeah, let me think. I, I mean... There's some good people. Um, I'd like to think about that. I uh, actually, hmm, a person who I also really respect as a Kiwi, and that's uh, Sir Stephen Tyndall. Now there is a man of genuine humility, genuine care. He's made a gazillion dollars. He doesn't need to work. He works his absolute butt off trying to help New Zealand. And he will, you know, I mean, everyone's got a call on his time. And he is the most generous, probably the most generous man I've met. I don't know if you, uh, and what drives that man? He, he, is, he is just a lovely, lovely human being. I totally agree with that. It's a great call. It's a great call. I know, Sir Stephen, and um, everything you just said is so true. Uh, Dr. Kerry, it's been an amazing hour and a bit. I, uh, I could keep talking to you for for hours about this stuff and I'll probably get back in touch with you. Um, growth mindset and everything we spoke about today, especially around the mental health thing is something that I'm really passionate about and know you are. Um, so thank you once again for your time. It was incredibly enlightening and I've made a whole lot of notes and I'm gonna carry on trying to grow. It's been a pleasure talking to you, John, and hopefully we'll catch up for a coffee. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> okay, see, see you later. Bye now. Bye.